Hey everybody, Navster here. And if you haven't already seen from one of my prior posts, I will be hiking the Colorado Trail this summer, starting in July. And I just wanted to give you a little bit of information about the trail. And, you know, since it's not one of the most known or well known as some of the other long trails. So I will be hiking the Colorado Trail with Wiley. Wiley actually hiked the Appalachian Trail with me in 2018 from start to finish. So we did that day to day or day after day together. And River, although he's not going to be doing the entire Colorado Trail, he's going to be doing about a week, I think, uh, hopefully a little more, but he's starting a day before us. And although he's a fast mover and has some long legs, I hope to see him out there, maybe catch up with him and see him a day or two. So a lot of the information that I've gotten from the Colorado Trail, of course, is from the internet. Uh, the Colorado Trail Foundation has a really good website. It's very professional and full of information about the trail. They also suggest, and I think, um, yeah, it's it's their book, or they support it in some some way, shape, or form. Uh, they have this book, which is the Colorado Trail official guidebook. It's the ninth edition, and it's a pretty good book, all color. Um, it basically goes through each segment of the trail uh, and gives information about that segment. And so it's all color coded through the pages. Um, the trail is about 485 miles long. So not as long as, you know, the big three, of course, but a pretty decent chunk. It most, it takes most people, I think, you know, again, this is all from my research, 30 to 40 days to do the entire trail. It goes from a town, southwest of Denver, which is called Littleton. Uh, so just outside of Denver, but it starts right there and goes kind of in a southwest direction to Durango, Colorado. So it goes through, uh, primarily it stays in national forest, doesn't go through any national parks, um, but it goes through on the, on the southwest end, it goes through the San Juan Mountains, which are some of the highest elevations in Colorado. And a lot of the uh, 14ers are in that area of Colorado. So at the, the starting trailhead, which is called Waterton Canyon, the elevation there is at about 5,500 feet. And the highest elevation on the trail is 13,271 feet. And overall, uh, throughout the length of the 485 miles, you stay at an average above 10,000 feet. So it's a pretty high elevation trail uh, for the full distance of the trail. Uh, some years back, uh, there was also some, you know, trail organization management issues, I think, between the Colorado Trail and the Continental Divide Trail. Uh, during that time period, the association that was managing and upkeeping the Continental Divide Trail seemed to fall in some kind of disarray from what I've read. Um, and the Continental, or excuse me, the Colorado Trail organization begin to maintain some of the Continental Divide Trail. So as a result, uh, somewhere right in the middle of the trail, kind of in the middle, there is a section that has been added to the Continental Divide, excuse me, too many C's. Uh, there's a section that's been added to the Colorado Trail, which is called the Collegiate West section. So the original path of the Colorado Trail stays on the Collegiate East side. This Collegiate West side is actually the Continental Divide Trail which is 80 miles long. And so there's a loop trail that, you know, that some can do that's about 160 miles long, um, if you'd like. Um, so that is officially part of the Colorado Trail now, even though uh, you know, the original section is a contiguous path that doesn't go around that uh, collegiate west loop. But overall, there are about 235 miles of the Colorado Trail that are also the Continental Divide Trail. And this is even if you stay on the um, collegiate east side of that loop. So with any long distance trail, there's there are dangers. Um, you know, there there's a lot of common dangers to, tra to hiking and trails, whether that's dehydration or wildlife, you know, sun exposure, those types of things. There are a few that are uh, maybe unique or, you know, more unique to the Colorado Trail. The first, the first of these is lightning storms. So although I've been to Colorado, I haven't experienced, you know, day after day of the famous summer season lightning storms, 
But from everything I've read and you know input and conversations I've had with folks online, it pretty much is a regular occurrence every afternoon in the summer. Uh, there's going to be thunderstorms that are also lightning storms. And so with you being on a high elevation trail, it's going to be very important to, you know, when you see those storms coming or when you hear them, um, to get to a low elevation spot as quickly as possible so that you're not a, an exposed lightning rod. Because the average elevation for this trail is over 10,000 feet, it's obvious that, you know, those that aren't used to being at that elevation have the potential of getting sick. Um, hikers that start on the Denver end that are kind of going southwest bound, their ascent to high elevation, it takes a little longer, uh, maybe 100 miles, whereas if you start on the uh, Durango end, you're going northeast, your ascent into you know up to 12,000 feet elevation happens very quickly, like in the first 25 miles. So a lot of hikers start near Denver and go southwest bound, which is what I'll be doing. Um, but at any rate, elevation sickness is a real thing, could even lead to, de lead to death. Um, you know, the, the mild symptoms, if you will, the, you know, the first phase are nausea, uh, heavy breathing, headaches that won't go away, severe headaches, those types of things. So, you know, there's also been research and conversations around this and kind of how I'm going to approach that. There is a medicine for elevation sickness. I believe it's called acetazolamide. Uh, that's the you know the chemical name, and there is a brand that's fairly common that is called Diamox. Uh, so Diamox is a prescription-based drug. Uh, I haven't been to the doctor to get that drug. Uh, Wiley has done that, and I think he's going to show up with some Diamox, or maybe another brand of the aceta acetazolamide. But in some of my research, there have been some medical studies around elevation sickness and how effective Diamox is. They found that it really only helps elevation sickness in about 25% of the time. Um, and they've done some comparison tests with other drugs, one of those being ibuprofen. And they found that it also helps with elevation sickness about 25% of the time. So. I have done some hiking at elevation. So I've hiked at Lassen Peak in uh, Northern California, which is out, you know, it's over 10,000 feet. I've hiked almost to the top of San Jacinto in Southern California, which is probably 9,000 something near 10. So I haven't been over 10 and a half thousand feet, uh, but I'm gonna go the route, at least initially, to take the elevations slow, so acclimate myself as much as possible in the first few days, uh, take ibuprofen, um, drink a lot of water, eat a lot of carbs, uh, all of the other things that people suggest that you do when you're going into high elevation areas uh, if, you're, if you don't know or if you think you're going to be prone to elevation sickness. So I will start with that, give that a shot, and uh, take things slow primarily in the beginning. And with Wiley having some Diamox <laughs> Uh, on the side, maybe if I need that, then I'll take that. But worst case scenario, um, if I have headaches and nausea that won't go away, then I just go to low ground and take it slower. So another danger that exists on the Colorado Trail uh, this year is snow. So of course with snow brings dangers like avalanches, uh, broken ankles or knees, post holing, uh, just general slowing, slowing you down while you're hiking. And this year in particular, uh, as we've seen in California and the Sierra, you know, the Rockies in Colorado have gotten so much more snow than normal. Uh, they're, I forget the, you know, they may be at 400% normal or whatever. You know, it's a large number, more than normal. And uh, that as of the first day of summer this year, just a few days ago, some areas in Colorado, how elevation got feet of snow, right, on the first day of summer. Normally, the Colorado Trail Foundation suggests that hikers start the Colorado Trail, if they're starting on the Denver side, no sooner than July 1st. You know, if some adventurous spirits want to start in mid-June, then they can do so. But this year, they're, su they're suggesting that those adventure spirit 
adventurous spirit type individuals don't start until maybe even mid-July because of the remaining snow that's there. So I've been tracking some of their snow reports. Uh, they do a weekly blog update every Tuesday morning, and I've been reading that to, to see which segments have been deemed passable with the snow. And aside from the, uh, the, the first day of summer snowstorm, those have been, have been becoming passable pretty much on a weekly basis. And there's also a weather gauge that tracks the level of snow at a particular point that's near the Colorado Trail. And in years past, what they've learned is, is when that gauge shows zero inches or feet of snow, uh, usually about one week after that point, the large majority of the trail is passable, at least all the way to the collegiate loop. So right now, as of this morning, I think that weather gauge had 21 inches of snow, so three feet, excuse me, can't even count, I'm thinking a foot has seven inches, so a little less than two feet. And, you know, according to when I will be there, I need that gauge to show zero inches of snow by about uh, the 5th or 6th of July. So this rate, as long as we get about, you know, three inches of, of melt per day, which is what the rate seems to be in the last couple of days, then we're going to be pretty good. Uh, there'll probably be some snow out there on the, you know, the northern slopes, excuse me, yeah, the northern, the northern facing uh, slopes of the mountains and the highest elevation points. So as far as gear goes for the Colorado Trail, I'm really only changing up two things from how I started the PCT earlier this year. So one of those, one of those items that I'm changing are gloves. So I didn't take gloves on the PCT. I'm going to take gloves on the Colorado Trail uh, because it's so high elevation. It's going to be cold at night uh, and in the mornings. Obviously, you know they say that you can go through every season in a day in Colorado. So uh, if I'm going to experience that, I probably need some gloves. You know, I stay pretty warm. I've learned, you know, especially at night when I'm sleeping, I stay pretty warm. And in the morning, you know, if I keep moving, packing up my tent and start hiking and so on, my hands, I know that uh, they will warm up. It's kind of a process that my body goes through. My feet warm up first, uh, my head warms up next, and my fingers warm up last. And I kind of know that process. And so as, as I pay attention to my body and it goes through it, I just know that, you know, in about 30 minutes, my hands or my fingers are going to be warm and that's fine. I'm still going to take these. I might send them home after about a week or so, uh, but we'll see. And the other item that I'm starting the uh, Colorado Trail with that I did not start the PCT with are uh, micro spikes. So these are the micro spikes that I'm going with. Uh, Catula, I think, is a pretty common brand, if I'm saying that correctly, that a lot of hikers get. And I looked at Catula. This is another brand that REI used to carry called Snowline. And they look practically identical to the Catula brand. Uh, they're called Chainson Light. And if you look at the specs on them, they're about four ounces lighter than the Catula brand. So uh, my experience with them in Southern California, because I did, even though I didn't start the PCT with them, I did have them shipped to me so that as we went over Apache Peak and San Jacinto and those areas that we would have them, they worked fine. I had no issues with them. They seemed to work as well as those hikers that had other brands. Uh, so I'm going to go with the snow line again. And, um, you know, if I get up into the snow or the high elevation on the Colorado Trail and the snow's gone, then I might send those home also because, you know, the, uh, the micro spikes and the gloves probably near a pound right there. So um, got to get rid of what you can. So uh, I think that's it. Um, just wanted to relay some information about my hike and the Colorado Trail. Again, the Colorado Trail Foundation website is a great website with a lot of information about it. I will, of course, be posting videos. Um, you know, there's 28 segments to the trail. So, you know, each trail, or excuse me, each segment is not the same distance, but you can, you can go through about, there's a couple exceptions to this, but you can go through about each section segment in a day's time. So I don't know that I will post a video about each segment, each day, those kinds of things. I'm, I'm guessing that it'll take us about 35 days to finish the trail. And um, that's about 15 miles a day, 15 miles a day. And, um, but at any rate, I'll be doing some videos as I go. 
Uh, so stay tuned if you want to see those. And thanks for watching. I'll see you out there on the trail. Later.